about uh, our science results, of course, we're, we're working to uh, get all that written up and, and uh, worked out. So the, the team members in our group that participated in the campaign is Olga Popova. She was the lead at the Institute of Dynamics of Geospheres and in, in Moscow. Uh, Vladislav Emelyenko at the Institute uh, of Astronomy, in, uh, also from RAS in, in Moscow. Uh, they were the leads. Um, I myself was invited. Uh, Anna Kartashova was a student at the uh, Institute of Astronomy. Uh, Jenny Berkyukov was at South Ural State University. That's one of the two universities in Chelyabinsk that are participating in this effort. Uh, Sergei uh, Kabakmanov was at Chelyabinsk State University. That's the other university, and his professor was Alexander Dudorov. So I'll introduce you to these people uh, while, uh, while we're at it. So, of course, the very first thing we did on the day we arrived was to go and visit the zinc factory. And uh, I was uh, really surprised to find that uh, this site was already being repaired. And uh, we were there uh, three weeks after, after this happened. And so already three weeks after this happened, uh, they were repairing the walls of this, of this building, which was sort of, for me, the iconic uh, image that came from this, uh, this, this event. It was uh, very exciting. So, so there's Olga and, uh, and Slava. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we were really excited uh, arriving at this site and having a, a, a chance to see this with our own eyes. The reason I was invited was uh, because um, just um, a year ago, uh, on April 22nd in 2012, we had this big impact here in the Sierra Nevada mountains over Sutter's Mill. And uh, that was a four kiloton impact. Uh, it created such a loud boom that it immediately uh, raised people's uh, attention and, and realized that this was a big event, this was something special. Uh, at the time, uh, the falling meteorites were detected by Doppler weather radar, and so uh, we actually knew where, in what general area they had fallen. And I was very lucky uh, just two days later to find pieces of it. And uh, with that, we initiated uh, a consortium study, and uh, a lot of work was done to try and uh, study the conditions of the impact and the properties of the meteorite. And uh, all this experience that we, that we had with Sutter's Mail, I was hoping uh, might be of, uh, of some use to our uh, Russian, Russian colleagues. Uh, before that, of course, I uh, was involved in the recovery of asteroid 2008 TC3. This is still the only asteroid that was seen coming in the Earth's atmosphere. It was tracked for about 20 hours back in 2008. And on October 7, it crashed in the Nubian Desert of uh, Northern Sudan. And with uh, Mawia Shadar, a researcher at the University of Khartoum, and his students, we went into the desert and we went, found pieces of it. And so this meteorite was studied uh, many ways. And what was, what was unique about the TC3, which was very uh, unexpected, was that the different meteorites we were finding on the ground were all were many different types. There were at least 10 different types of meteorites found. And, uh, and that uh, sort of uh, meant that even an asteroid that is just uh, four or so meters across uh, can be uh, an interesting little world. It's a really, it can be a really fascinating place to visit. It's not a monolithic piece of rock, but it's, it's, a, it's a complicated place. And uh, a place that tells a, a story about its history, about how it, how it was formed, how it evolved, how it ultimately uh, broke into pieces, and one of those pieces ended up crashing through the Earth's atmosphere and land landing on the ground. And so many of these meteorites were studied, and uh, quite unique uh, properties were, were being found. And so this was uh, still an incredible t story for me, because uh, it was my first visit to an Arabic country. And uh, it was incredible to meet the students at the University of Khartoum at the time to actually find pieces, because our expectations of that were very low. And uh, to, um, to then find that these meteorites were really, really interesting. So uh, that was sort of my message going into to Russia, is that uh, these, these, uh, these asteroids, these relatively small asteroids coming in the Earth's atmosphere, are really interesting worlds that people should treat as such. So not just consider one single meteorite, but really look at, look at this as a, as a, as a, as a, as a little, little, uh, yeah, little world. So Chelyabinsk, uh, very quickly, um, 
from uh, the fact that it created a, a boom, uh, an infrasound signature, a, a low, very low frequency sound wave that traveled all over the globe. It actually uh, went around the globe and bounced back a few times. It was incredible. This was picked up uh, all over the globe and very quickly um, uh, Peter Broughton and Canadian astronomers in, uh, analyzed that data and uh, found that it we were talking about about 500 kiloton impact. Now 500 kiloton is, is more than a hundred times the size of Sutter's Mill. This is such a two orders of magnitude bigger event than Sutter's Mill was that it was really a very, very unusual event. And the river uh, is heavily contaminated by uh, pollutants because uh, this is where the Russian nuclear um, uh, weapons program was developed in uh, just after the Second World War. So initially there was a lot of uh, nuclear waste dumped in the river. Uh, the, the plume itself didn't come into the area where we were, but the, the Thatcher River itself, most of the contamination of the river itself was, uh, was accumulated in that period of time. And uh, this is one of the villages. If you, if you d drive to it, this is the river. <laughs> it's just beautiful, beautiful scenery. Uh, but uh, a lot of people were, had to be evacuated from the area. And still, uh, uh, that evacuation is still going on and, and understood. Uh, we traveled through the areas and uh, the villages there were really ghost towns. Uh, other places in Russia were just so beautiful. I mean, the most wonderful scenes. Uh, we are in the, uh, just on the uh, eastern side of the Ural Mountains. Uh, so the, the Ural sort of uh, continue on. Uh, we, we actually, uh, going to Belfast, we went into that area, the Zukali. Uh, I uh, just uh, learned to love those beautiful Russian houses. Very colorful, uh, colorful doors and windows. Yeah. Much better. <laughs> so our strategy was to, uh, when we went to a village, is to find out where the marketplace was. Because uh, the, uh, the servants in the marketplace uh, had just listened for three weeks to people telling stories about this. <laughs> Every single person we talked to had uh, a, a great story to tell. They either experienced the shockwave, they uh, saw the fireball, they uh, heard stories about it, uh, they got injured. So the, there were a lot of different, uh, different stories to tell. And um, uh, these, uh, these folks had really a good sort of overview on what happened in the village. <laughs> and so what we did, we usually talked with the, the persons in the market and then we talked with some people in the, in the shops or uh, out on the streets. And uh, as I said, the, the, the stories was, was incredible. I, I have that from hearsay because this was all in Russian and it was all being translated uh, afterwards. Uh, but from the expressions on the faces and the waving of hands, it was very clear what they, what they were talking about. Uh, we met fantastic characters on our travels, uh, the most fu uh, funniest of which were the ones that um, had figured out the trajectory, that knew exactly where the track was and that were going to explain to us where they saw the track on the sky and, and how that then would translate to where the, the trajectory ran on the, on the map. So back in uh, Chelyabinsk, um, the, the glass damage uh, scene was not that obvious. As I said, most of the uh, damage was repaired by the time we were there. Uh, you could still see it in uh, some of the balcony uh, covers because that, uh, that was not uh, repaired by the government. So you see some pieces of glass missing here and there. Uh, it was not always easy to say whether it was from the, from the uh, event itself. But for example, a site like this in Atkul, it was right under the track. Uh, here it was quite obvious. This was a house with really big windows where all the windows were still covered in plastic and, or, just, uh, or just completely... Uh, empty. Uh, the, the traditional houses, the traditional wooden houses did a lot better. Uh, they had much smaller windows and so, the, uh, so it wasn't that often that these windows were, uh, were broken. Uh, in the villages a lot of the uh, places that were damaged were the schools. 
the kindergartens, uh, because those were the buildings that had the big windows. And uh, here is a school, for example, where uh, some of the windows are still uh, covered by uh, the paintings by the kids. Uh, this was the school furthest to the east, where we found damage. Uh, these two corner, these two corner windows were uh, were damaged. Uh, it was really surprising for me to notice that the, um, not a lot of the injuries happened in the schools. So in general, uh, people were sort of shocked, and uh, and the reactions were very uh, similar to what we would have when there's an earthquake, for example. It suddenly happens, you go like, and then uh, it also, of course, was quickly uh, over. Yes, it was. Uh, the sun was only up for uh, three minutes or so. Yeah. yeah. Yes, a lot of people were uh, on and about. Yeah. And so we try to uh, also go to the hole in uh, Lake Chebacul. Uh, you all heard about this hole. A fascinating story. Um, there, uh, there is gold. In them late. <laughs> uh, there's supposed to be a big chunk, uh, 200 kilos or so, uh, of rock sitting uh, in the mud on the bottom of the, the lake. And it looks like that the trajectory of the fireball is indeed pointing to ch that, uh, that hole in Chabaco Lake. Uh, so we do think that uh, here is for one of the fragments, of that, that leading fragment that you can see at the very end that that, that uh, uh, came, came down in. Um, there were reports of small little meteorites found. Uh, we just wanted to check out the site. There was not a lot we could do at that location. And in the end, we were stimmied. But because by the time that we, we came to Chibarka Lake, uh, there already had been some freezing periods and thaw periods that uh, uh, closed up the hole, put some new snow on it, and also uh, then put a layer of water on the ice. <laughs> so we started walking towards the, the hole. It was a, there's a long walk ahead, and we discovered water in our footsteps and decided that maybe it's not a good idea. <laughs> uh, but we did uh, um, get to meet with Professor Grotkowski in uh, uh, your Federal University in Yekaterinburg, and uh, he led one of the first studies of the, the finds of the meteorite, reported the first material found, and, and uh, we were able to take pictures of these little meteorite bits that were found uh, uh, around the, the hole. And uh, you can see that these are really pieces of meteorite. So these are really ch little chunks of meteorite. Uh, we try to um, uh, verify other reports of, uh, of meteorites found in the Chibakul area, but weren't, weren't successful. Now the purpose I, I went to Chelyabinsk was not to find meteorites. That was not the goal. We knew by the time that, uh, that, that we, we got this campaign together and we were able to go there, that by that time, new snow had fallen, and it would not be possible to go in and search for meteorites. And uh, this picture just demonstrates <laughs> demonstrate that, that fact. Of course, we had to take, uh, take the shot. So our method of uh, uh, trying to map out where uh, meteorites fell, uh, because we're very interested in knowing that, as it tells us where the traject it is in relation to where the trajectory fell and how much material came from the ground, uh, was by uh, going to local um, uh, people and who had found meteorites, and then asked them to show us the meteorites so we could take a picture of them with a scale with it, and that way, um, and that way uh, see what sort of size distribution of material was found, and then we asked the people where exactly they, they had uh, recovered that material. And, uh, and that uh, allowed us to uh, sort of map out a number of sites in the area to sort of get a, a general idea on where uh, pieces fell. And this was uh, really an incredible collection of really small, tiny bits of meteorite that had been found on a, on a lake bed nearby. A lot of kids, children, who found meteorites went out on the streets and uh, had found a few. Um, under the track itself, as I said, we spent most of our time in, uh, in the outlaying areas. Um, because already there was a lot of information on the internet on, on, the, on the damage of the event. Uh, but it was interesting to go to the uh, most heavily affected area in uh, Yamanzelinsk and talk with um, uh, the uh, an administrators there. Uh, we talked with uh, uh, Mr. Ivanovich. 
uh, and he brought us to uh, one of the schools that were uh, badly affected. And as you can see, the school had now been completely repaired, and its beautiful window frames were in there. But um, Ivanovich also shared with us some of the pictures he took uh, really uh, immediately after the event. Uh, this is him taking, looking up at the sky uh, just a few minutes after the fireball came by. This was the most uh, heavily, this was the area where, the, where you saw the red glow in the video. So this is the central, about 23 kilometers altitude. And you can see there's two, two uh, cloud uh, billows at that time. Uh, this is an effect of um, uh, buoyance. So the, 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 the hot air rises, and then it makes two cylindrical vortices. And those, those then billow up. And that gives you, gives you that double structure. And you can see that because we had a massive dis disruption end at the very end. And continues on, the bellows are much closer together because it's uh, just a lot less inflation going on there. And so this is uh, this is a little bit later, and you can see that uh, now the billowing is uh, is closing up. You don't you don't see that effect anymore. Matter of fact, you see sort of uh, a separate uh, layer in between looks like. Now this was how the school looked like before, <laughs> just after the after the event. And it, uh, the, really, the windows uh, hadn't just uh, broken. Uh, the whole window frames had come out and, uh, and they were blown on the, on, the, on the street. And in this case, uh, the damage was on both sides of the building. So both, uh, both sides were uh, damaged. These are uh, just some other scenes of uh, Jemanzelinsk itself. A lot of false uh, ceilings were coming down uh, due to uh, under pressure. So the air sort of sucked out after the event, usually when one of the windows breaks the door. Immediately after the event, uh, all the windows were boarded up and um, with, uh, with everything that people could find. Because uh, when I was there, temperatures dropped to minus 17 degrees Celsius. They were usually around minus 11 or so. Uh, but then the next day, they could be plus 6. So you know, um, so it was very important to, uh, to, to stay warm. And so uh, people used everything they could find that first day to, to board up their windows. And then uh, the, governor, uh, the, st the state officials uh, made plastic available to people to, ha to help in that process. And then very quickly after that, the next day, they started uh, cleaning up the mess and um, to uh, repair the windows that were taken. And uh, it was, uh, to me, surprising to see how quickly that uh, uh, was accomplished. But uh, yeah, if the temperatures are that low, then you are motivated. <laughs> That's just some incredible pictures. So uh, he took us to, to some sites that still had a lot of damage, uh, like uh, abandoned buildings like this one in uh, Stralski. This was one of the uh, sites we visited where uh, you could still see those, uh, fall, those uh, false ceilings come down. Uh, this was a, 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 a gas station. Uh, we stopped uh, to, to review off that. That door there, uh, that inner door, and uh, as well as the outer door, I guess, had broken. And uh, that then caused the, the ceiling nearest to the door to, to, uh, to be sucked down. So we, we asked um, uh, if there was any structural damage in uh, Jemanslinsk itself. And uh, they said no, except that the statue of Pushkin was damaged. <laughs> so then I had to see the statue of Pushkin. <laughs> and uh, so he, <clears throat> he took us uh, to the local library. And uh, there, in the entrance hall, stood the damaged statue of Pushkin, now all wrapped in, in cloth. And uh, you can see why it got damaged, because it was standing right next to one of those larger windows. And uh, the window frames were completely blown in. As you can see, they are sitting, they're still sitting there on the side. Um, and uh, so I'm, I, I'm guessing that the window, window hit the, the, the statue, and that's how it got damaged. Uh, we did meet with a <clears throat> lady who reported that her uh, house was uh, cracked. So there was a crack running all the way from the top here. Uh, to the bottom after the event. Uh, but again, uh, when we arrived, uh, she had already plastered the, 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 the crack. So in general, the structural damage was, was fairly mild. 
We talked with, uh, tried to talk with other eyewitnesses, but you know. Uh, we did get to meet with uh, the, the one family uh, that was actually hit by one of the falling meteorites. That's normally uh, an event that happens more often. In this case, it was fairly rare because Russia is, uh, that area is really, all the people are located in villages. So there's nobody living in between the villages. It's really very concentrated in small spots where people are living. Uh, this is in the town of Depetatsky. Uh, you see here the structure, the damage that was created, and, and a gentleman showing us the, the meteorite that caused the, caused the damage. Uh, and uh, the really most exciting thing for me was that we met some people that saw the fireball in the sky and got sunburned from just looking at it. And uh, this gentleman reported that uh, after some time after the event, uh, his skin was peeling, like you have it normally when you have a, a sunburn. And this was uh, at, uh, in, Cor in Corkino. And uh, yeah, uh, as you can imagine, uh, just talking with all these people and going to all these villages, it's just such an incredible trip for me. Um, but to top it all off, uh, I got to go and see the fall area from the sky. Uh, we got to fly up in one of these two-seater uh, training planes, Diamond D20. And uh, from that, I got to see the uh, Chelyabin's area from the air, from the direction of uh, the fireball. So this is uh, the town of Depetatsky in the distance there, looking out towards uh, Chebarko. So when I finally left, it was with, with some tears and some uh, sorry to have to leave. Uh, there was a lot of things, of course, we could have done, we wanted to do. Uh, we're still doing, uh, because uh, all of this helped organize the uh, search effort a little. Um, and I was presented uh, with a nice departure gift, which was uh, a little stack of postcards, postcards from Chelyabinsk. And these postcards uh, showed me all the buildings, all the sites in Chelyabinsk, which I had not visited. <laughs> <laughs> and so one day I hope to go back and uh, I hope to to see those sites as well. So thank you. <clears throat> Peter, I'll just <clears throat> start off with the question. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, put your hand up if you have any questions for Peter and we'll get around to you. First one, uh, now there was a, a an <clears throat> passing of an, uh, another near Earth, near Earth asteroid um, very close to the Earth, very, on, a, on the very, if it wasn't the identical day, it was like the day before or after. What evidence, what scientific evidence do we have to say that those were unrelated? Can you? Uh, the orbits were very different, uh, as in very different orbits. So uh, Chelyabinsk uh, orbit uh, was relatively eccentric and uh, went uh, uh, a little bit further in towards the sun. And, uh, the object that uh, passes by as an asteroid was in, more, in much more circular orbit. And so the objects came from different directions and they were just, just unrelated completely. Peter, I think it's Dave Hodge at SUNY, their, astro, their astrometry group. Sorry. Ha, it's Jill. Okay. Have, um, put to, have a routine where they just scrape all the pictures that are taken on Flickr, that are posted on Flickr, and they pull out the stellar backgrounds. And they have phenomenal precision at telling where the camera was that took that picture. Is that, or have you already done all that, or would that be of use to you? Well, the, 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 the cameras that took the video of the fireball do not have stars in it. There's no reference frames of, of any sort. So the, all the reference information you have is the foreground. So you really need to find the location where the foreground is. Now, the nice thing is, because of all this interest in Chelyabinsk, a lot of people had already investigated that and had figured out for each video where it was taken. So we had already approximate locations for all the sites. So then it was more, the trick was more that when you visited one of these sites uh, is to figure out exactly where the camera was. And if your features are about 10 meters away or so, it's really critical because if you move your camera a little bit, that's, that's how much your, your angles are changing. Hi, over here. Uh, so what are the logistics for getting a big rock from the bottom of a lake, like that big rock from the bottom of a lake? Uh, 
uh, I um, I think the mayor of Chebaku probably likes his monster of Loch Ness, just, uh, just, just where it is. <laughs> but um, I, 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 of course it would be very interesting if this could be recovered, because here you have a, a potentially a chunk um, of material where things are still in context. Uh, and that probably comes from a different location in the uh, original asteroid than the small pieces that were found near uh, the Tatsky and so on. Um, on the other hand, this, this piece, uh, when it hit the ice, could have broken into smaller fragments as well. And so um, it's hard to say how, uh, whether, what, it, what would be involved to really recover all that. Um, I don't know. It's not, it's not that deep. Uh, did I understand you saying that the asteroid was captured by the gravity of the Earth and went around the Earth once before it... it no, no, no. Uh, the infrasound wave, the, the sound, was so loud that it could be heard all over the globe. It actually traveled all over the globe and back. Uh, the, um, uh, the asteroid itself uh, came from a direction of the sun, on a, on a little bit eccentric orbit. It came from the direction of the sun. And so that's the reason why uh, there was no chance that it was, uh, would have been picked up by the near object surveys. Um, it uh, it stayed in the sun's glare for uh, until it uh, until it hit hit uh, uh, Jelly Evans area. Hey, was there any hearing damage due to the blast? Right, right here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> was there any hearing damage? Anybody experience any hearing damage due to the blast? Was it that loud? Yeah, um, we did ask uh, those questions. We were very interested in uh, all the things that you don't find. On the internet, the smells. What did people smell? What did people uh, feel? What did people uh, hear, and so on? Um, but uh, no, uh, we've uh, had no reports of uh, air damage. We've had no reports of lasting eye damage either, uh, which uh, we're very interested in. Were there unexpected chemical composition uh, of, of the fragments that have been found? Uh, the the meteor are being analyzed and this is one of uh, this is one of the things that we're investigating um, we know it's an LL5 chondrite so it's a it's a regular sort of ordinary type of a meteorite like we have many others uh, so in that sense uh, perhaps uh, we, we are not in for the same sort of surprise as we were in Sudan uh, but on the other hand uh, we also know it's a brescia so that means that um, it's a jumble of rocks uh, with a lot of um, uh, sh shocked material penetrating uh, cracks and so on that uh, that's being recovered and in that sense each rock is different if you look at individual uh, meteorites that are being found you can see that they do look uh, all a little bit different so uh, so I think that also in this case uh, uh, we could be in for a surprise if if enough of these meteorites are going to be analyzed were there stories about what people thought they were experiencing immediately afterwards. I mean, there must they think it was yes. Did any, and were there any stories of that sort? Uh, as a matter of fact, the most interesting stories are the ones on the videos themselves, because uh, you can actually hear people uh, respond to what they see in the sky, and it is uh, surprising that some people actually got it right. They actually say, "Oh, this is a meteor." <laughs> um, other people had other ideas about it. I mean, you know, uh, there's, uh, there are stories like that with, uh, with any uh, event. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it was, was really bright and it sort of made a big impression. And the smoke cloud was such a massive, uh, massively visible in the sky that it really attracted curiosity for quite a while. I, I had a question. I thought the asteroid at some point exploded. Apparently it didn't. Apparently all this damage was just due to disintegrating body flying hypersonically in the shock wave that it generated. Exactly. Is that it? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So in that way it's just a sort of a normal event. It's just a big a big body coming in at a high speed and that's what you get. Yes, exactly. Uh, with the caveat that this is what we are that's this is the topic of our study. <laughs> this is what we like to uh, understand is exactly how did how did this shock wave uh, how was this shock wave generated? What it, what what was its Disintegrating. The strength of the shock depends upon the speed of the body, the size of the body, 
Yes, but it was also it was also disintegrating and going and disintegration. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how what's how how much how how much of the material has been recovered so far? Uh, you know, aside from what's sitting at the bottom of the lake. Yeah, that's very hard to say because uh, very quickly after the uh, event, many people went to the area and searching for meteorites, and uh, they were actually not that difficult to find because the meteorites, when they fell in the snow layer, right, created these little uh, tubes, yeah. uh, little holes in the snow. Uh huh. And uh, those little tubes were then filled with powdery snow okay. in uh, the days following. Uh -huh. And uh, the powdery snow um, uh, solidified in the same way, so it became ice, in the same way as the surface layer of the ice does. Okay. And so uh, your, uh, uh, what, the, what the meteorite hunters would do is they would uh, look for these little holes, they would then dig next to the hole down, uh, and then they would grab into the powdery snow for these ice popsicles. And when they uh, when we find a nice popsicle, they would take it out, and then the meteorite would sit at the very end. <laughs> 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 and so, in a way, uh, meteorite collecting in the, day, in the days immediately after the event was very efficient. Um, the The question is how efficient it was done. I, uh, a lot of the searching seemed to have happened relatively close to the, uh, the towns and cities and, and roads and so on. Uh, and so, uh, there was still probably a lot of material. Uh, that is that is to be found, and at the moment the snow has has melted, and so people are back in the field and trying to find more material. Okay, and the and about how high was it up when when it fragmented? About uh, the uh, the main disruption was at about twenty three kilometers. So that's okay. that that uh, that uh, red glow that you see there. Right. Oh, they're right. They glow yeah. that uh, the trail there. Yeah. But the meteorites were found under that spot. Oh, really? So that means that those meteorites were not coming from that event. The meteorites must have come from uh, much earlier in the disintegration of the object. Yeah. And uh, it's really interesting because from that disintegration, you can see that there is at least this one piece surviving. In the videos, you can see also a couple of other pieces, smaller pieces come out. And so uh, there has to be more material that survived this event and that must have scattered quite a bit further down. Uh, as far as I know, uh, none of that has been found yet, except for the tiny bits of material uh, that were found on Lake Shabarkul. So I'm hoping that more material will, uh, will, will be recovered and we'll get a better sense on, uh, because that material may sample different parts of this 20 meter sized body. Oh. Um, were you able to take any meteorite pieces back to America? Uh, yes. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I was donated some material uh, by the people uh, who were showing us the meteorites, so it was very, very kind of them. Um, and uh, I, you're very welcome after the talk to come and look at those. Uh, I had a question about that picture of a, a circle that looked like uh, somebody who made a big hole in the ice or in the... Yes. Uh, that's the... That's the Loch Ness in, uh, in, in Lake Chibakul, it's the it's the hole. That wasn't produced by the meteor. That apparently was produced by this fragment that you see at the very end, continuing on, uh, ultimately uh, uh, some of it making it to the ground. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, all. All indications are that that was indeed caused by the by the meteorite. Has anybody scaled up what the damage would look like if it had come in more normal? Um, yes, that's uh, that's the eerie question is uh, a lot of damage was done. A, a, um, a lot of glass was, was destroyed. Uh, minor structural damage. A lot of people were injured, by the fl mostly by the, by the flying glass. Uh, what would have happened if the circumstances would have been just a little bit different? Uh, it, it could quickly have been a lot worse. And, uh, and it's really, it, what the, the one thing that surprised me was that the meteorite crater in Arizona, the object that caused the meteorite crater in Arizona, wasn't that much uh, bigger an object, <laughs> you know? So it's really, it's really interesting. Um, it's really interesting to, uh, to, to, to think that. And I think that's what's the importance of uh, Chelyabinsk, is that here we have an, one example that is very well observed, that we can study very well. Uh, resulting in uh, certain types of damage on the certain ent certain entry circumstances. So if we under if we can understand that event well, then that 
helps us then understand what might happen if, if the objects get bigger and, and come in at different angles and speeds and so on. Peter, um, we have a uh, special container for those meteorites <laughs> that you have over there. And please join me in thanking Peter for his fantastic talk.